It's always um, it's always a pleasure to uh, uh, for us to host Marvin Kalb here at Politics and Prose. Uh, I've lost count of how many times uh, Marvin has been at PNP for book talks. Uh, this may be his eighth appearance, but I could uh, be missing some. Uh, so let's just say that we never get tired of having Marvin. Uh, of course, he's familiar not only to many of you, but to countless people across our country and around the world, certainly to people who follow the news and still subscribe to the belief that journalists play a vital role in keeping the public informed, in speaking truth to power, and in safeguarding our democratic values and institutions. For, uh, for those of us of a certain age, Marvin was a fixture on the nightly news. His broadcast career spanned more than three decades at CBS and NBC. He was bureau chief in Moscow, chief diplomatic correspondent in Washington, and anchor of NBC's Meet the Press. He's been a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School and the founding director of Harvard's Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Currently, he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and senior advisor at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. So clearly, Marvin has had too much free time on his hands. <laughs> and I guess that explains why he also has written more than a dozen books relating to politics, history, and current events. Marvin has been in the process of writing his memoirs. An initial volume came out last year under the title the Year I Was Peter the Great. You have to read the book to understand what that title <laughs> means. Uh, but it was, uh, it was about his time in the Soviet Union in the 1950s. Uh, but he decided to interrupt his memoir writing and instead do a book on Donald Trump and the press. And in the process, shed the objectivity that he has tried to maintain for so many years as a journalist. An enemy of the people, Marvin makes no secret of his disdain for Trump and his deep concern about how Trump's incessant attacks on the press uh, threaten to weaken the ability of news organizations to inform the public. He retraces the origin of the term enemy of the people, explores the parallel between the current Trump era and the McCarthy era of the 1950s, recounts the determined efforts by Edward R. Murrow to expose McCarthy as a fraud, and makes an impassioned case that the press, now more than ever, must play a central role in resisting authoritarianism and preserving democracy. There is, Marvin writes in his concluding chapter, no other option. Now, Marvin will be in conversation uh, here this evening uh, with another very familiar presence to all of you, I'm sure, Andrea Mitchell. Uh, Andrea is currently chief foreign affairs correspondent at NBC News and host of NBC's Andrea Mitchell Reports, which airs weekdays at noon. In her 40 years with NBC, Andrea also has covered uh, the White House, Congress, political campaigns, and far more other kinds of stories than there's time to mention here. She's as experienced as they come, and one of the best there is reporting today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Marvin and Andrea. It is fitting that this is a standing room only crowd for Marvin Cow. And uh, I have been honored since 1994 to have the title that he once had at NBC, one of, the t one of the many titles he once had. And I learned so much from him. But now we're really at an inflection point, as this ti the title of Marvin's book indicates, and as Brad indicated. Um, Trump's war on the press, the new McCarthyism, and the threat to American democracy. And it turns upside down everything that people like Marvin and a lot of, of your other colleagues in broadcast and print have always felt was the parameters, in fact, the paradigm of journalism. Objectivity, David Brinkley once told me, is an impossible challenge because just by the choice of what you decide to put on the 22 minutes of the nightly news, you're making an editorial decision. But within those confines, you are trying to achieve a certain balance. And I always thought of myself as a, on the one hand and on the other hand, journalist. What has happened to 
change your mind? And how do you think that that is a, really an objective lesson for all the rest of us? Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> thank you for being here. Um, thanks to Politics and Prose for setting this up and hosting it. I am slightly in awe at the moment looking at this crowd. It is extraordinary. Um, this was not an easy book to write. Um, it went against the grain, as, as Bradley was saying, you were saying. Um, what happened was that on February 17th of last year, I was invited to do a talk down at, at the Cosmos Club. And it was about the history, it was supposed to be about the history of journalism over the last 50 years. I'm not used to these things, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Um, I want you to know that <clears throat> Marvin, among other things, was one of the original, the last and the youngest, Murrow boys. So he comes with uh, yeah. radio background as well <laughs> as, as television. No, so what happened was that um, I was pretty much finished with the writing of the book and looking forward to the evening event. And I got a call from a friend of mine um, who has a friend at the White House and the friend at the White House told my friend that the president was going to be speaking tonight about the press and he was going to say something that was going to aggravate you. And he wanted me to know that in advance. And he also thought it was important enough so that I would rewrite the top of the piece, which I proceeded to do after he told me what it is that the president was going to say. I was shocked. I was stunned, I was surprised, and the basic reason, I think, was that for me, the expression enemy of the people was an expression that I had last heard, uttered by a leader, was in 1956, when Nikita Khrushchev, then the leader of the Soviet Union, did a speech at the 20th Party Congress in which he attacked Joseph Stalin, and he ticked off the reasons for the attack. One of them was, that Stalin used the expression enemy of the people too easily, and that once you were labeled an enemy of the people, you were effectively dead. And what struck me was that here was a communist leader saying of another communist leader that it was unacceptable to use that expression. So what made it acceptable then for the president of the United States of America to use that expression? I was, as I said, shocked and I felt, I felt somehow violated. I, I didn't, I couldn't at the beginning believe that that was happening. But then since that time, he has used the expression regularly and he loves fake news and he gives big speeches on why we're all so terrible. You know, I was at a, a meeting at Stanford last Friday and interviewing uh, a Stanford law professor, Nate Persley, who were we were discussing the digital, the impact of social media and the kind of branding and why are we re repeating his tweets? And I said, well, if the president of the United States fires the secretary of state on Twitter, I have to report it. And you as a former State Department <laughs> correspondent understand that. We don't, have to, we don't have to report all of the accusations. I think we do when he challenges uh, the leader of the bin Laden raid, Admiral McRaven, a great hero, and, and disparages him. So there are certain things that have to be reported, but how do we decide um, what to do? Because Professor Persley, a Stanford law professor's conclusions from some deep academic study is that when we fact check the president, and I argue, well, it's okay, I'm fact checking it, and I'm putting it in context now, uh, that in fact the headline that is absorbed by most readers, at least of social media, is the original headline, the accusation even if it's in the same sentence, they do not absorb the correction. And Andrea, this was exactly the problem that journalists faced way back with McCarthy. Exactly. Because McCarthy, when he started in that, he did a, a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia in February of 1950. And in that speech, one of the things he said was, pulling a sheet of paper out of his pocket, he said, I have a list here of 205 communists who are working at the State Department. Well, the lead that the AP put out was Senator McCarthy, uh, whatever said that there were 200, and there was the lead, and there was the story. 
And it wasn't that the press said, wait a second. They didn't say that at all. And one of the reasons that Murrow got so deeply involved in this, there were two major reasons, but one of them was that the story wasn't being reported right. He felt that it was fundamentally misreported. And the other reason was that for Murrow, who had covered the rise of fascism in Germany before World War II, one of the things I remember him saying was that he knew Germans in, say, 1935 who were wonderful people, and they read the same books that Murrow read, and they went to concerts with him, and Murrow felt very comfortable with them. And three years later, in 1938, they walked around with Nazi uniforms and were killing Jews all over the place. So that hit Murrow powerfully. How do you take an advanced society and turn it around so quickly that good people people you are raised with, went to school with, suddenly are transformed. How does that happen? And that was in Murrow's mind, and one of the reasons, more, I think more than even the journalism one, that set him on a course. He wasn't just out to get McCarthy. He was out to give McCarthy all of the time he wanted, in effect, to hang himself. And in the great broadcast that Murrow did, in March 9th, 1954, in that broadcast, a 30-minute broadcast, Murrow had McCarthy speak. You could see McCarthy for 22 of those minutes. Murrow was not on in that 22 minutes. The last two minutes of the program, I urge you all to go to your fancy little machines and pick it up. It is an amazing two minutes that you see a journalist speaking about a powerful issue. And I want today, you know, people ask me all the time, is there another Murrow? And there isn't. There isn't, and there probably can't be. He probably wouldn't be hired at CBS today. But you all collectively have the power still to dig up the story and, and provide it to the American people. And I'm absolutely, in fact, I get furious when people time and again rip into the press. That's, I think that's one of the reasons that, that the president's criticisms of the press irritate me so profoundly. The press is a fantastic asset in a democracy. It's what keeps us going. When there is something to be hidden, a reporter will find it one way or another, they're going to find it. You're going to find it. A colleague will find it. And it'll come out, and people will then know it. And if they know it, maybe they'll do something about it. What comes to mind is the concern that a lot of us now covering the administration have is that we, we don't have the bandwidth, and there is an attention deficit order syndrome implicit in the velocity of things that are happening. We are not drilling down on agencies as often as we could with, you know, some exceptions. Things are happening at Interior, EPA. Um, the newspapers have risen to the challenge. The broadcast networks are hiring more and more deeply uh, experienced print often print as well as broadcast people in investigative teams, but just to keep up with what is happening at the administrative level because there's so much coming out of the White House. Some of it is important. A lot of it is not important, but all of it gets covered. And so he's one figure is filling the vacuum and everything is reported within the prism or through the prism of Donald Trump. And that includes foreign policy. Your expertise, of course, from your early days in 1956 in Moscow, is foreign policy. You've covered all of the secretaries of state. What do we lose when you can't travel with the secretary of state? As Secretary Tillerson started, and there's been some adjustment under Pompeo. And what do we lose when we don't have regular press briefings, even though they're not terribly valuable? There were three, I think, since July at the White House. And new rules, by the way, tonight. New rules. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Sarah Sanders said that uh, Jim Acosta's press pass is being restored, but that from now on there will be one follow-up only and only uh, if the president permits it and that people will have to follow certain rules, which 
certainly limits the ability of the you know well-intentioned and and um, dedicated White House reporters, and there are many there, to follow up and get answers. I think there's nothing wrong, obviously, with the follow-up, but there is. Uh, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the idea of a reporter having a question and then a follow-up question, maybe a second follow-up. But the idea that a reporter puts himself in a position of taking a lot of time that other journalists have a perfect right to as well. And I think that what Jim Acosta did in the now famous confrontation with the president was to ask, I don't remember exactly the number, but it was like five or six different follow-up questions. Other reporters have a right and therefore deserve some of that time also. So I can sympathize in a way with what the White House is trying to do if I believe that that was all the White House was trying to do, and I don't. <laughs> I think that the White House is trying very hard to contain or to put, to make the President of the United States the single most important spokesperson for his administration, for the United States of America. He doesn't want other people speaking on behalf of his policy. He feels he can do it best himself. And that's what we see. He's stopping all the time to have now brief back and forths, the Sam Donaldson type of questioning. Um, that's fine. Sam did it in the highest, most professional way. And for the president to turn to an NBC reporter who asks him a question, was a very valid and important question, and then declare that's a stupid question, and you're always asking stupid questions. That is unimaginable. What is the motivation? The motivation has to be, he wants to be totally in charge. He is the most important, he is the most important politician in the world, and he wants everyone to know it at all times. He wants to fashion the image of America in his image. In a way, he is the image. He is the president. But when you think about the president of the United States, and then you think about what he said today about, or yesterday about Congressman Schiff, shifting a couple of Fs to Ts, yeah. can you imagine a president doing that? I cannot, frankly. Uh, but he does it. And then the responsibility falls to you and people like you to put that into a kind of context and sort of not to let him get away with it. Having said that, I'm not quite sure I know what you do. But. Uh, <laughs> well, one of the problems that we have is facts. And as uncomfortable as it is to be the person who is always saying, the president said this today, but it was wrong and these are the facts, that's not a role that I ever wanted to be in. You always wanted to put things in context. And presidents make mistakes. We are all, you know, people misspeak. We do, they do. But there was there is a deliberate intention of just ignoring facts. And it goes for press secretaries as well. So the podium at the White House, which has always been, a, 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 with a few exceptions, always been a place for that represented the United States. The press secretary represented the government of the United States, not just the president mm -hmm. of the United States. And so the White House was a, a fairly sacred place, in, in yeah. a way, yeah. in terms of truth. I covered Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan for eight years, Jimmy Carter as the fill-in. I was a junior correspondent. And during Bush 41, I was on the Hill, but had a lot of interactions with him. You know, I was the kind of person you'd send to Kennebunkport for Thanksgiving weekend. Um, <laughs> and none of these presidents, Bush 43, I covered the White House. I was the chief White House correspondent with Bill Clinton. None of these presidents enjoyed tough questions. My experience has been that all of them, Obama, Clinton, both Bushes, felt that it was a necessary part of the job, of the role, and there was a higher purpose, a constitutional purpose, of interacting with the American people through the press. And yes, presidents have gone over our heads, but with the use of local media, radio, and now you know social media, 
But in this case, it's not just using social media to go over our heads. It's simply misstating things and then labeling any contradiction as fake news. So he's the best brander we've ever had. Mueller is a witch hunt, and now 46% of Americans believe that's the fact, according to the exit polls. We have even you know, higher negatives than, mm -hmm. than Bob Mueller. And it becomes dangerous when you go to a rally, as my colleagues did in 2016, in an open carry state in Alabama, and you're in a huge arena, and from the podium, the candidate is shouting out, uh, you see so-and-so from NBC over there. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's part of, you know, she's the problem. She's the fake news. And at one point she's written, Katie Turr, my, my wonderful colleague, has written um, that the Secret Service jumped into action to escort her out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just because they're law enforcement officers and we're concerned about her safety. So there are ramifications. It's not an accident that journalists were targeted by the pipe bomber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, let me try to carry that one step further. The subtitle of this book um, is The Threat to American Democracy. My gut feeling is that we can talk about ways in which journalism has changed over the last 30, 40, 50 years, in my case, 60-something years. I, I remember when and I see now. That change we can live with. We can ride with that because it is within an established democratic context. My concern is that what the president is doing by attacking the press is attacking one of the pillars of American democracy. You attack the press. You invalidate the power of the press. You humiliate the press. You are, in my light, by my judgment, humiliating democracy. That is my fear that when you begin to go after the press, then you go after the courts, then you go after judges, and then you go after the Department of Justice, and you put your own private lawyer in there, um, you, are, you are weakening the foundations of democracy. And I have a feeling, and this is really what is, irritates me more than anything and concerns me more than anything, you, when you go from one political system to another, um, it doesn't happen at noon on one day, bingo, you're now something different. It happens over a period of time when certain institutions in the government that you're used to become weakened because they're constantly under attack. And when they are weakened, you don't see it as it's happening because everything looks the same. But it is being weakened, and one day it can snap. Do you know the day that will happen? No. Do you have a sense about the weakening? Yes. But we all tend to feel, because we've lived in this society for so long, that you can weaken something, but it'll bend but not break. Because we are all in our hearts, I guess, patriots. And we believe in this country so completely that we can ride with the bend and everything will be fine. When Trump goes, America will return to being exactly what it was before. No, that is not what is likely to happen. And that is at the heart of my concern, that we are now in the midst of a revolution that is slowly turning America into something that we don't know the true shape of as yet, the contour of the heart of it as yet. But in my gut, I, not in my, I mean, I can see it, you can see it, we all can see it, but we feel it without knowing where we're gonna end up. And you can't know where you're gonna end up. We used to have a, a professor at, um, at a small place in the Northeast that I know named Crane Britton, and he used to teach the French Revolution. And he would always say, don't think that if you read the newspapers of the revolutionary period that you know what was happening then. He said, you really don't. He says, you need 20, 30 years before the system has changed. And we can look back and say, ah, 
That's when it turned. I wanted to go beyond the media and ask you, just because of your vast experience in foreign policy, what you see happening. When the president went to Paris, a former national security official said he was sitting in his hotel room instead of going to the cemetery that day, but nobody had asked for a bilateral with him. He had one meeting with Macron. And it was so extraordinary because anytime the American president shows up in a major capital at a summit, at a gathering where so many leaders are, everyone is knocking on the door. They want their moment with the, the president of the United States. But after the NATO meeting and after what happened in Helsinki and after what happened in Singapore and after uh, certainly what happened uh, in Canada with the way he t treated Trudeau, um, nobody was asking to have a meeting with him. I find that to be amazing and frightening, don't you? Because it, it may be a, a symptom of this change. Um, somebody said the other day, I forgot who now, that, that we're at the tail end of an historic turn that, that really started at the end of World War I, when people went into a collective mode, if they could pull it off, ideas like the League and then the UN and then uh, the EU, all of these, uh, what the thought behind it was that if we came together, the problems are so large, if we came together, we can solve these problems, but together. And I think that, that President Trump is part of a very significant revolutionary movement. He's not the only one. We can point to 10 different countries where what has happened in the U.S. is happening there as well. well Poland, Hungary, Italy, yeah. now Brazil, yeah. um, the stirrings in Germany. Yeah, and so people feel, I don't know, but the leaders that you're citing here, they probably felt that there was no point to talking to a president of the United States. Now, what does that mean? I mean, we think about the Middle East right now. In the Middle East, the country that is the number one country that all sides turn to is Russia. I mean, during Henry Kissinger's time with Richard Nixon, the whole point was to keep Russia out, and we succeeded in that. And now we have just pulled back ourselves. Uh, going forward, how do you see the responsibility of all of us, those who are journalists and those who are consumers of the media, those who are voters, uh, most importantly, those who don't vote, but how do you see the importance of what happens in the next two years? Huge. <laughs> Huge, big time. How uh, this plays out, again, I don't know. Who does know? Um, but think about it. Um, let, us, let us say that the Democrats in the House begin to investigate a lot of stuff. Let us also say that Mueller, who has already put out two significant reports, one report on the technology involved in collusion, and the other, the report on the Russian side of collusion. It would seem to me logical that within the next, I'm guessing now, week two, three, that Mueller is gonna come in with a report that, that, that goes directly on the role of Americans in possible collusion with the Russians. And I, that could very well be one of the major reasons that Donald Trump right now is so impossible to deal with because he knows what's coming down the pike. We don't, Mueller doesn't leak. But you think about that, that starts something huge. How does the president respond? Is it entirely likely that when Mueller comes in with the report, and we'll play a game now and hypothesize that the report is very anti-Trump. Trump can say, based on the heightened value that he has given to fake news and the enemy of the people, um, Trump can say, I don't accept that. I simply don't accept what Mueller is saying. What happens then? Where is the system of governance? I mean, this is a, this, where is the system of governance that allows for a president to declare when something is announced by part of the US government? I don't accept that. 
I'm sorry, I was elected president, you weren't, and I don't accept what you've just done. What do you then do? Where is the power then in the country? Where is the ultimate authority? Supreme Court? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> where are you going? Up to the hill? Thank you very much. Um, where do you go? And this, to me, is the most difficult aspect of where we are today as a democracy. You know, one of the things that is concerning a lot of people, a lot of reporters who especially who are down in Florida, is the efforts to diminish the credibility of our electoral system, both through um, obvious efforts at suppression, but also through presidential statements saying that there is voter fraud, saying that people are going in and changing clothes and coming back out <laughs> in costumes. Superman. And, you know, voting again. But think, you know, go fast forward to Florida in 2020. Uh, if we don't correct some of the problems that we've just experienced, you're now talking about a presidential election, uh, which could well be decided by one state or, or fewer. It's okay. And if Florida could be at the center of that kind of dispute, Florida, we, we, all know, we all know that it happened before, but this could be within the climate of an angry, far more polarized um, country. I mean, this is not going to be a gracious concession as Al Gore gave, uh, even though he didn't believe that he had lost the election. Um, even, even go back to 2016 and when in his final debate, uh, candidate Trump suggested that he might not accept the results. And we now know that inside the Obama administration, that was one of the reasons for President Obama's caution in letting the intelligence community set off, you know, bigger alarms about the Russian, in, you know, intrusion into our system. Because he was afraid that Trump would use it to not accept mm -hmm. what they had anticipated would be a defeat. So just imagine going forward to 2020, if for some reason he runs, he loses, and won't accept the verdict. And you were asking before, what over the next two years? You're talking about something at the end of the two-year process, right? And I was trying to suggest something that could happen within the next month or two. In other words, we are in for a very bumpy ride. And exactly how, where the road leads to exactly, I don't think we know. We know the broad contours of the argument, but the pieces are um, unknowable except at this point in terms of speculation. And the speculation, I think, is sound when you worry about what it is that is on the president's mind. It is, it is, I'm not aware of any president we've ever had in this country um, who is examined as much for his policy and style as his mental approach to reality. And I'm not pushing this too far. I'm simply raising it as an issue because I have heard it and you've all have heard it. There is a question about how far he will go in pushing what he thinks is right. And to what extent is there a countervailing force powerful enough to say, no, you can't do that. And that is, that's at the heart of my concern. And for me, it starts with the press. It always does. And when you think about the expression, enemy of the people, this is not a new expression. It goes back to Roman times. Nero was the first recorded enemy of the people. And then you can go through history and wherever you find a troubled time and you have the reporters or the dissidents on the edge sort of circling the problem and trying to figure out what's going on and speculating about what's going on and the person in the middle doesn't like it, then you're an enemy of the people. And depending on his power, he can either kill you or something short of that, so uh, cut into your standing in society that you lose everything and you're fake. I mean, everything that you've stood for all of these years 
suddenly is seen by 40 some odd percent, whatever it is, as fake. Where do they then go for the truth? What becomes the truth? In other words, we're at a point now where fundamental values and questions are up for consideration. Well, one thing that does come to mind is that in this new election, in this election, there are new members of Congress in both parties, uh, more Democrats, one than Republicans, but they are younger. Many have military backgrounds. Uh, many have been used to a different kind of leadership, dealing with real problems, life and death issues. And um, I, some have suggested, and I've talked to a lot of these people as they were running in the campaigns, many are women, and a, a record-breaking number, as we, we know, more than 100 women. And so that's where I am putting my, um, <laughs> that's where I'm putting my, my hopes. And, you know, also on the press being as persistent uh, despite the disparagement and despite the effective, very effective way to try to diminish the impact of whatever fact-telling uh, we persist in doing. I just want to say, um, you, your prescience in writing this, I mean, you were one of the first to see it and to produce this book, and it is, it is a, a call to, it's a wake-up call for a lot of people. And uh, I, for one, want to thank you as someone who has followed in your footsteps and learned a lot as you have mentored many people. Marvin Kalb. Um, and just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you got it. Yeah, I have an assignment, which is, uh, <laughs> which happens all the time. But this one is in New York, and uh, there, there are. There's only one flight left, so I'm gonna. There are a lot of questions here. A lot of you, I know, want to ask Marvin questions, and he and Brad are going to uh, manage that, as as I know you can. And so I'm going to run to the airport to be on the Today Show in the morning. <laughs> but um, I hope with your intelligence, it's been a real privilege to be here with you tonight. Andrea, thank you very, very much for coming. Most appreciative. Oh, and there's Andrea's husband, Alan Greenspan. Alan and I went to George Washington High School together in New York City. <laughs> he said, therefore, we both think the same way. And I'm going to sit in this chair and I guess audition for NBC News, right? This, right. Is, this is the NBC News chair. All right, if you have a question, um, we have one mic today. Uh, so please line up over there and first question. Yeah, um, you've alluded to this a little bit, but something that's been bothering me is that I feel that because the rest of us, not including Donald Trump, are operating on the basis of law and decency, that we're at an inherent disadvantage fighting against somebody who sees no rules. So how do we deal with that? I think we keep on fighting, right? I mean, what, what would be the point of abandoning the fight? That would leave him in the ring and nobody else to take him on. That is really, and I, I know that I'm saying this as, as an ex-journalist, but I truly believe that when journalism is active, when there is freedom for inquiry, for asking questions, for pushing, and Jim Acosta did it perhaps excessively, but what was he trying to do? Get answers. Um, that is where that is the um, that is the area of combat. It is the the heart of of power. And then all of these guys and gals running around, throwing little gentle darts and sometimes very tough darts. Each one of them a probing question, answer, get at the truth. And what I was saying before is in my judgment anyway, um, um, at the heart of where we are today as a nation, we are struggling with fundamental values, such as a search for truth. 
we might have been, all of us in this room, raised to believe that we knew it, but maybe now we don't. So we, you cannot abandon the struggle, is what I'm saying. <laughs> We and I have it have it a maximum six more years of Trump, and then he'll hopefully be gone unless he declares martial law, and then you know everything is everything's up in the air. But what do we do with the forty percent of the population that believe him? I mean, even on NPR, you know, they have talk shows, and people call up and repeat, you know, that the caravan is full of Mid Eastern terrorists and and our country will be destroyed. And these these are the people who listen to NPR. I'm not talking about the people who listen to Fox News. Um, and it's not that the whole press is condemned. It's only the opposition press is condemned. And Fox News, you know, everyone, the 40% think Fox News is real news, whereas we are the fake news. And we ought to be aware that Trump himself has provided a number on this. Trump has said, and Marianne Conway has followed up and repeated it, so I'm sure it's true. Uh, Trump has said that 91% of the press, 91% is fake news. That only 9% is news you can believe in, and that's Fox. He was very specific on that. So if 91% of what you or everybody gets is in his mind fake. And let's ask ourselves the question, does he really think it's fake? What, no, what he, he critical. would like, what many leaders who drift toward authoritarianism would like is for everybody to love him. Right. And for the press, which the representative therefore of the people, that the press would write positive stories about him all the time. Every day, 24 hours a day, just lay it on. Tell me again and again how marvelous I am. When you depart, that is a violation of his image of himself. Right. And therefore of the country. And he regards you then as an enemy of the people because you're not playing the game. Well, in this particular case, we are um, stuck we're stuck trying to find our way through all of the fake news and all of that, and it takes time. And we are all going to have to spend a little more time trying to find out what's going on. And if Trump says X, maybe that's true, but maybe it isn't. Right. And in the past, I forgot the exact numbers, but something like 6,000 lies or misrepresentations since the time he took office. From the post. That's that kidding a home run. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm concerned that we're hearing in the news uh, and reading about that our nation has not been this divided since the Civil War. And I believe that. Uh, and my concern is, and I'm wondering what you think about this, do you think that we are heading towards another American, uh, you know, civil war? Because we have these two sides that are so, there's so much hate. And, and that's where, and I'm, I think if, if Trump loses, what is that 40%? How are they going to respond to that? Yeah. I'm very concerned about that, and I'd like your views on that. Well, I share your concern, perhaps not to the same extent that you're stating it, but I share the concern, as I tried to say earlier, that we are at a time now where our fundamental value systems are being questioned and are being weakened. To what extent are they weakened? To the point where the concepts themselves have lost validity? I don't think so. But they are weakened. And to what does that mean that they can't grow back in strength? No. Yes, it can. But it takes a great effort on the part of the American people to do that. That's going to have to be expressed in a ballot box. A couple of weeks ago, the American people voted, and now Democrats will be in charge of the House. That's a fundamental change. 
And there could be others of that nature coming down the line. So we can't be totally gloomy. It is possible to move in other directions. But that requires a great deal of energy. I know that there's one young lady in this room um, who was talking to me the other day about what she was doing during the last campaign. And a young woman I met in Nashville the other day said that she went out uh, with her husband, the young people, and they were there every single day trying to persuade people to vote, people who had never before voted. Then you get in what Andrea was talking about. Let's say they vote and they are immediately dismissed as illegal aliens. So we're in a tricky time now. And uh, how it all ends up. Anybody have a cheery question? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kalb, 44 years ago, also in November, you signed your book that you wrote about Dr. Kissinger. It was written along with your brother. I want to thank you very much. It was up there in the thank Jewish you. Community Center in Rockville. <laughs> My mother wanted to go hear what you had to say, so I'm the driver and I took her. Thank you. Um, let me just say this. I don't work for the Nationals, but I'm well known as a baseball guy. So am I. And we have the same situation that if you w try and watch and decipher the MLB network, there's so much stuff going on about the Nationals that half of it is untrue. And it's not to say what, it's the same as the White House. But I grew up at a time, I would appreciate journalism, from when you and Walter and Doug Edwards were CBS. And I will say this, what I say about Lester Holt, what I say about Brett Baer, who was here a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and what I could say about the late Tim Russert, because I think political journalism suffered when Tim lost his life to heart disease. I will say the same for you. Nothing got by the caliber of people like you. Nobody can hit a fastball on you. That's a very, very kind thing to say. But I have a feeling you're not right on that. <laughs> I'm quite sure they got a lot of fastballs past me. Hello. Uh, the Fairness Doctrine, Fox, is, I think, a 24-7 state propaganda channel. Anything we can do about that? Well, you don't have to watch. Oh, I don't. I don't <laughs> but that 40%. Yeah, and I think that 40% will pretty much stay there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's no reason for them to leave. And I think the viewing patterns are pretty well set, and they have been set um, and fashioned by the most extraordinary guy I've ever met in, in the television news business, a guy named Roger Ailes. An evil genius. Roger, yeah, he's an evil genius, but he understood how you reach in to a block of the American people and satisfy them. And he set up Fox. And Fox, within a matter of four years, leaped to one of the top channels in the country, where it remains. Yeah. They have a very solid base. I, and I suspect they will be that way until such time as the focus of their political attention weakens. When that begins to, sh to shrivel up, as I hope one day it will, um, the viewership at Fox will change. And look, at the people who run that network want to make money. You make money with eyeballs, the number of people who are watching. When the number goes down, they lose money, they'll change. Yeah, I, I think if we get lucky enough to get rid of Trump, Pence does not have the charisma to keep, to keep all those lunatics. Yeah, well, that's, that's probably... So I think we, we've got three more in line, right? So these will be the last three. You've been talking a lot about television. Uh, what's your thoughts on radio? In, in uh, Indiana this summer in July, and they were beating up very hardly, very heartily on Senator Donnelly, who since lost. But, I mean, that was starting back in July. Uh, friends said people are used to vote Democratic now are being influenced by Rush Limbaugh, Jim Beck, or Gene Beck, and sorry, others like that. Can you comment on those people as opposed to just Fox, please, and, and their impact and the impact of radio? Because a Fox of, News also 
has taken over yes. radio in many, many places. Yeah, and that's a good point, and thank you for raising it. The, um, the power of right-wing radio has been there before Fox. Mm -hmm. <clears> They've <throat> been there a long time. Fox gives it new life. And so people like Rush Limbaugh, my, I don't know about the numbers here, but I remember about 20 years ago, he had 20 million people tuning in in the course of a week. That's phenomenal on radio for one station to have that. He still remains the number one guy of that type on radio. But there are a lot of others because of the very nature of the internet. There are a lot of small stations. Um, <clears throat> Breitbart, for example. Uh, you can go to www.breitbart.com and you can see all of the stuff they have on their website. They also have a radio station. This phrase, enemy of the people, did not just come in to the president's mind, it was put there as a result of a radio broadcast that Pat Cadell did for Breitbart about seven or eight years ago. So this has a great power. There's no doubt of that. And for all of the people who are absorbed with television, there are even more who listen to radio. And, and what is the role of hate in this? It seems like so much of this is based on hatred and anger. Can you well, comment on that? That is there for both radio and television. Yeah. I mean, they, they, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. <clears throat> Hello, I just had a quick question. Um, and thank you for being here. You're, you're a legend. Um, but so what would the issue be with uh, reporters in the, the White House press corps um, calling out the president in the moment? And when I say that, I don't just mean like Jim Acosta and then everyone else, um, everyone else just kind of accepts what goes on. Uh, you know, you remember when uh, Bush 43 had the shoe th thrown at him in Iraq? Yes. So what is the issue with throwing verbal shoes at back at the president? Because he is so for someone like myself, I'm from the New York area. We've all known of Donald Trump as the charlatan that he is forever. He's been like this his entire life. I mean, anyone that pretends to be another human being when you're trying to be your own publicist to get stories out there. Um, so that's kind of just my question. Why do people accept the reporters in the moment? Because we all know after things are said, it goes back on to TV and Lawrence O'Donnell, everybody else, yeah, Chris yeah. Hayes, everyone's saying what, what, how outrageous. But why not in the moment? Or is everyone there not saying this is unacceptable? No, I think, I think probably everybody thinks that it is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But it is a question then of how you react to that. Mm -hmm. I was suggesting earlier that I think Jim Acosta asked too many questions mm -hmm. on that one shot. Mm -hmm. However, however, that is not to say he did not have the right to ask as many questions as he liked. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of style. Uh, somebody would ask um, a president a well thought out question and be ready with a follow up, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's even good to ask a second follow-up. But journalism today is split right down the middle, by the way, increasingly so, between those people who are, I'm calling them traditionalists, those people who have done it for many, many years in a certain way. They are generally polite. They're generally very professional, and they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then there are, there's another group that is emerging now, led by Chuck Todd at NBC. And Chuck believes that we have taken enough of this stuff, and now we're going to fight back also. Mm -hmm. And he believes that when the president attacks a reporter's story, the reporter then ought to get on the air or write the story about how he got what the original story was, what the sourcing was, how he got the information, how he wrote it, all of that stuff. In other words, fight back with providing the people 
with information about how the story was got, so presumably the people will then understand that it's not fake. Now, is that going to work? There's a little bit of fanciful thinking there, mm. and it may not work, but I'm just trying to say to you that journalists are very conscious of this, mm. and, and they themselves are, are split down the middle now on how to handle it. Mm. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question here. Okay. Um, well, I have a little follow-on to that one. My fantasy was that when Donald Trump says, that's a stupid question, and the reporter in some fantasy situation stops, then the next reporter asks the same question, and the next reporter asks the same question <laughs> until he answers the question. I mean, really, it's just insane to be like, shut up by him when he's making a really absurd and unfair response. Okay, so that was not what I, I wanted to ask you. Do you... <laughs> do you think that's possible, Marvin? Um, I think it's what's happening in a way. Let's say that a reporter asks a question, the president says it's a stupid question. The president then goes away, gets onto a plane and flies somewhere. There are reporters waiting for him at the other end. If it is a major story, mm. every reporter knows it and they're gonna ask questions. Reporters are people who are not shy most of the time and they know how to throw a question at a person of power. Mm. Um, so Trump probably feels that he's being asked that question over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, but I think in a press conference, when what you're TV's thinking on uh, a, right then in the press conference yeah. where he cannot get away. Yeah, get I have a that. feeling that reporters, each reporter has his <laughs> or her own, own, own question. ego and wants to ask a question in their way. There might in, be a few guys who want to support the, somebody. But, I, but right. I think it's a nice thought. Okay, okay what's, so what's the, your question? When the question was... Do you think it's possible that any of the Fox News reporters might start seeing what's going on? That has already begun. Okay, but that I has mean already more. begun. Okay, because it seems to me that you know, no one in the fake news is going to convince anybody who's a Trump supporter yeah. to change. So the only people who might would be Republicans or Fox reporters. Yeah, who no, that's that's a very good point, and. All I can say is that it has already begun. There are about three or four of the lead anchors, mm -hmm. not just ordinary guys running out to get the news. Mm -hmm. The anchors themselves mm -hmm. have begun to question what management is doing. The problem with Fox, I used to do commentary for them years ago. Mm -hmm. it, in the daytime, mm -hmm. they are more or less the same as everybody else, really? more or less. Mm -hmm. The problems begin at night, and management put three people in there, eight to nine, nine to 10, 10 to 11, who are there to play to the base. That's where they get their money, that's where they get their support. So they and those three people, led by Hannity, does a, they do a, phen a phenomenally successful job selling a particular point of view. Now, until they get into the act, Chris Wallace and, and Bear and a few people like that will not have enough clout among themselves to, to change. It ends up essentially with making money. If Fox does not make as much money as it did last week, right. they're going to ask themselves why. And if they decide that it's because Hannity went too far, mm. you got to pull them in. Uh, they'll be, they'll change. It, it's not a mystery. <coughs> Losing my throat. It's not a mystery. It's, it's a very doable thing. Let's do it. Yeah. So, so Marvin, Thank this gentleman, much. this gentleman is dying to ask a question. So let me give him okay. the mic here. I just wanted to say uh, that I'm feeling very lonely um, in this audience and in this uh, lecture. I've not heard. I, I don't recollect having heard the name of a foreign country. Um, is it the policy, is it an American policy to pretty much ignore the rest of the world? Uh, uh, is that deliberate? And, uh, you know, is Russia, Russia's interference 
not an example of how the world can creep in and, and influence American policy uh, by totally ignoring the rest of the world. Thank you. I think you. your question is an indication of the degree to which the president has changed American policy. It was not that way up until two and a half years ago, two years ago. It was very much what it is that you're describing. But the president is determined to change his policy, and because he is president, he can change the policy of this country. He was voted into office legitimately. He didn't come in with an army. It was a free election. He was elected by the American people. He is a... I'm sorry? All right. He was elected by the Electoral <laughs> College, not the people. He was elected by the system of government that we have. And, you know, the, the, the irritation is obvious. And what happened a couple of weeks ago in the election is a powerful indication that there are a lot of people in this country who don't like the way it's going and they want to change it. Will the president accept the change that I think perhaps is inevitable? I mean, there, there is where we're going to see a pretty big story unfold. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you all very much. <laughs>